Coming up on this episode, Buddy Heald continues his red-hot shooting to lead the Warriors to another blowout victory over the Jazz in Utah on Friday night. Welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast. No live stream after this game, and to be totally honest, I didn't think that I was going to do a podcast episode until tomorrow. As you can see, I'm on location, just finished watching another impressive victory for the Golden State Warriors, a 127-86 win over the Jazz in Utah on Friday night. An unbelievably good performance from halfway through the first quarter, you would say, the starting group, which I'll get back into in a minute. Uh, Again, a little bit of a concern. They were very good in the third quarter, started very slowly. The Jazz got out to a 19-11 lead, and from then on out, It was all Warriors, a 41-point win led by none other than Buddy Heald, who after going for a team high, 22 points on, uh, what was it, five of seven shooting from three-point range on Wednesday night, has another team high, 27 points in less than 20 minutes of action, 19 minutes and 55 seconds to be exact, on seven of nine shooting from beyond the arc, 10 of 14 from the field, just an unbelievably scorching hot performance from Buddy Heald. And it was a bit of a rough go offensively for both teams in the second quarter. And that late barrage of threes that Buddy produced in the first half to end the first half was really what catapulted this victory. It allowed the Warriors to go in with a 14-point lead, 56-42, to close the second quarter. And basically from there, the game was never beyond, it was never within doubt uh, Golden State came out and the starters, as I said, much improved to open the third quarter, got the Warriors out to a 28-point lead within five minutes to open the third quarter. And from there, it was just another easy blowout victory, which allowed Steve Kerr to uh, rest his main guys again in the fourth quarter. No one played more than the 27 minutes and 25 seconds that Steph Curry played. We'll talk about him and his performance in a second, but... Yeah, I just thought that I couldn't wait till tomorrow after such an impressive victory. I had to jump on and give some quick takeaways and thoughts from this game, the 41-point demolition job from the Warriors. And, I mean, we have to talk about Buddy Heald. I just said there, 27 points in less than 20 minutes. He now has 12 threes on 16 attempts to open his Warrior career over the first two games, which I think is a franchise record for most threes over the first two games. But... Everyone's going to point to that. Everyone's going to point to the shooting. Everyone's going to point to 49 points through the first two games in literally literally like 40 minutes of action. Like he's not even playing a whole lot. None of these guys are because of the, the deep warrior rotation. Steve again going 12 deep in the first half. And of course, the main guys being able to rest in the fourth quarter. I actually don't want to look at the shooting because the shooting is just, I mean, it's out of this world. It's unbelievable. Yes. But there's something to be said, and I think the most important thing here from a Warriors standpoint is the fact that they've got Buddy so engaged and so active offensively and the the movement in terms of that, that it's also filtering into every other aspect of his game. So not only does he have the 27 points in this one, he goes, he has four rebounds, he has a game-high six assists, I mean, he's just doing everything right now. And there's a play in the second quarter where he jumped in a passing lane, got the steal, ran the fast break, gave it up to Wiggs. Wiggs Wiggs gave it back to him for a layup. And I'm just shaking my head thinking, this guy is, like, we know he can shoot the ball. Like, that's never been the issue. Like, he shot 40-plus percent from three on eight attempts throughout his career. But the fact that the Warriors have got him doing everything else in terms of just being so active, the energy... It's it's crazy. It is unbelievable how active Buddy Heald is right now and how engaged he is. And I said it again on last episode, like playing in a style like the 76ers, you know, like a half-court offense, like to get the ball to Joel Embiid in the post. And, you know, you just sit in the corner on the wing and you don't do anything. You just stand there waiting for for the ball to come to you for a shot. Like, This Warrior offense, there's so much movement obviously going on. They're running as fast as they can in transition, even off makes as well. And it's just fitting Buddy Heald so perfectly 
that he's been able to produce these performances. Now, will it remain? No, he's going to go through his stretches where, you know, he doesn't shoot the ball overly well and he's less effective as a result. We know that's coming, right? We know there's going to be a regression to the mean somewhat, but the fact that you even get these performances, like these two games, I didn't think Buddy Hield would be this good at any point throughout the season for the Warriors. I thought, you know, okay, maybe it'll take some time for him to adjust Maybe it'll take you know some time, particularly defensively, for him to get into the swing of things and, and prove not just effective on that end, but not be a liability on that end of the floor. Like Buddy Hill right now is playing well defensively. And I think that's, that's almost more of a surprise in the 12 of 16 from three-point range. Again, he's super active. He's getting on the glass. He had, I think, five rebounds on Wednesday. He had another four rebounds here. Again, less than 20 minutes of action. He's moving the ball well. Like it's it's mind boggling mind boggling how well he's playing right now. Like you run out of superlatives to describe how well Buddy Hield is playing. And I don't think even the most optimistic Warrior fans would have seen this coming. Because I thought, okay, yep, he can give you twelve, fifteen points. He'll have some games where he maybe gives you twenty. But you know what? He's he's gonna play twelve, you know, fifteen to eighteen minutes. On a good night he'll play a bit more. And he'll be a solid role player. Like, I mean, right now he's averaging 24 and a half points a game, 12 of 16 from three-point range, leads the Warriors in scoring over the first two games. I mean, he has been an absolute star. There's no other way to put it in these first two games. Again, will it remain? No. But the fact that you're getting this production from Buddy Hill is, I mean, it's just crazy. It is just crazy what we're seeing right now. And not just in terms of the shooting. I want to reiterate just the overall energy and activity that he's playing with around the whole game, offense, defense, rebounding the ball, everything is just absolutely insane right now from Buddy Hield. So shout out to him. He has been unbelievable. Now, yes, it's against two lesser opposition in the Trailblazers and Utah Jazz, but again, not even the most optimistic Warrior fans would have thought they would come out, play this well, and win these two games by a combined 77 points. Combined 77 points in these first two victories. I was going into these two games on the road thinking, okay, please just win both of them. Like, you're going to be favorites going to both. Just please just win both of them. I don't care how much by one point. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's all, all that matters is getting the win uh, at the end. That's 1.41 points. It doesn't particularly matter. But going forward for how good this team can be, I mean, we have to take a lot from the fact they've blown these two teams out by a combined 77 points, allowing Steve to rest the key guys, getting production all across the roster. Yes, Buddy has been the standout so far in the first two games, but my goodness, there's so many positives from a Warriors standpoint. The second, the other big positive for me in terms of just the activity and the energy levels and stuff like that, Andrew Wiggins didn't have a good shooting game in this one whatsoever. Three of 10 from the floor, two of four from three-point range, which is okay. You know, attacked the rim a few times and couldn't finish. But the fact that he goes out and has a career-high, career-high 10 rebounds in the first half, finishes with, uh, what did he have, Tw- uh, 10 points, 13 rebounds, five of them offensive, five assists, couple of block shots, again, all in just over 23 minutes. It is unbelievable the energy and the activity that Andrew Wiggins is playing with. and just. You can tell, like, the buy-in, right? He His buy-in mentally and emotionally is back. And I think we've been missing that over the last two seasons. Remember when he was doing this kind of rebounding stuff in the playoffs and in the NBA Finals? He had a 16-rebound game against the Celtics in the NBA Finals. I think it might have been game five, I believe. And we all went from there thinking, okay, well, Andrew Wiggins is just going to be a guy that averages seven, eight rebounds per game now in the rest of his career. That hasn't really played out so far over the last two seasons. He's been, you know, he's capable of getting seven or eight rebounds, but usually, you know, you can have other games where he's two or three. And it's a bit like Kaminga, you know, overall it averages out to four or five rebounds a game. He's just so active right now, 13 boards. And again, he's not going to have 10 plus boards every game, but I think it does go to show the buy-in right now, mentally and emotionally for him. And even if the shot's not falling, if he can rebound the ball like he did, if he can be a part of a defensive unit that strangles teams like the Warriors did to the Jazz, then he's going to be effective regardless of whether the shot's falling or not. And we saw on Wednesday, he had an efficient 20 points 
what was it, nine of, uh, I don't even remember what his shooting splits were in that game, but he can be effective even if the shot's not falling, if he's going to be rebounding the ball and playing defense as hard as he is right now. So that's, like, as good as Buddy Heald's been, I'm almost, like, more impressed with Andrew Wiggins over these first two games just because I think the the Warriors going into this season, for them to get back to being not only a playoff team but, you know, a threat in the Western Conference, they needed Andrew Wiggins to return to somewhere near his all-star form. And what we've seen over the first two games is exactly that. Again, we need to see it against better opposition. They'll play the Clippers on Sunday in the home opener at Chase Centre. We need to see it against better opposition. But again, Andrew Wiggins, from an individual standpoint, couldn't have done any more in these first two games. Yeah, sure, could have shot the ball better today. It doesn't matter to me. Just seeing him being as active as he was is is a fantastic sight to see for Warrior fans who many of us, I'm not sure I'd say I gave up on Andrew Wiggins, but maybe I gave up on the idea of him ever reaching the all-star level that he was two season, you know, a few seasons back in, in 2021, 22 now. Now, I don't think he's going to be an all-star necessarily again because there's just so much talent in the Western Conference. But like he's, his first two games here are, are pretty close to what he was doing. And we got to see it over a longer sample size, but it's an amazing start. There's no doubt about that. Other things from this game, what I really like, Trace Jackson Davis. My God, this is like five games in a row now, the final three of preseason, the opening two games where he's been such a force on both ends of the floor. Perfect 6-6 six six shooting. He's uh, not missed the shot. I think he's 11 of 11 or something like that over the first two games. He has another 12 points, nine rebounds, one board shy of a double-double, played less than 17 minutes, 12 and nine in less than 17 minutes. Um, completely negated anything that the, really the Jazz had uh, at the center position in terms of Walker Kessler, like he outplayed Kessler, outplayed anyone, any big guy that, that the Jazz were throwing out there. So Trace Jackson Davis, a huge positive right now. Uh, what, I mean, what else? I mean, there's so many things, you know, pods going for 15 points after going scoreless the other day, you know, the three ball still not falling, but that's probably a positive. I mean, there is some, there's some stuff here where the Warriors can actually get a lot better. Like this has not been flawless completely (laughs) like I mean can you be too critical when you win two back-to-back games by a combined 77 points no you can't but I mean Steph today 20 points four of 13 shooting from three-point range I mean Steph is going to shoot the ball better from deep he's what I mean what was he the other day three of seven so he's now doing the quick math seven of 20 from three-point range to start the season, like he's going to start shooting the ball a little bit better. That's a worry for opposing fa- uh, opposing fans, opposing teams, when you see the Warriors winning these games so easily. And Steph, very impactful on Wednesday with, you know, a near triple-double, 17 points, nine rebounds, 10 assists. But today, you know, he had 20 points in the end. That's solid. It's, it's reasonable. And he only played just over 27 minutes. But, I mean, the fact that you haven't had to rely on superstar Steph Curry performance. And that was the big concern for us fans in the off season is like, we're going to be relying on Steph so much on any given night, even against these bad teams. I thought, okay, we're going to really need Steph to fire here just to win these game. you know, any game on the road. It doesn't matter what the opposition is. We're going to need Steph to fire. Well, he hasn't done a whole lot, at least scoring wise in the first two games. And again, you win them by combined 77. It's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, Anything else here? Moses, again, 12th man coming in, uh, you know, just does what he does, 12 points, another good performance from him. I What I do want to say just in terms of the defensive side of the floor is I, I said last episode, well, not last episode, the episode before on the, the, live, uh, the live stream talking about some of the lineups Steve was going with and in particular kind of the four guard lineups where you've got Looney at the five, or there was even a lineup today where they had, I think it was three guards, Moody at the four and Kyle Anderson at the five. Now, I don't mind seeing Kyle Anderson at the five, but I would have thought you might have Kaminga next to him or Wiggins next to him, or at least, you know, two wings, like two of Wiggins, Kaminga and Moody, like two of those three alongside Anderson at the five. But no, he went to like three guards, Moody and Anderson in the lineup. Now, Will you be able to get away with that against better opposition? Maybe not. But what I will say about these three and four guard lineups is that the Warriors have like real defenders out there and guys that try really hard on defense. So Melton elite defensively, 
GP2 elite defensively. Pods tries really hard on defense. Like there was a possession there, I think, either late first, early second quarter, where he was one-on-one with Markinen and he really just bodied him. Like he really got up into him physically and ended up making him take a tough fall away jumper at the, the shot clock buzzer, which he missed. Like just the physicality of those guys. Yes, the Warriors are giving up a little bit of size there, but the physicality, like, Pods is being really physical. Melton and GP2, we know are elite defenders. So it's actually, as of the first two games, the Warriors are getting away with, you know, and Steve's getting away with using these three and four guard lineups because those guards that are out there are actually really, really good defensively and, and either are elite defensively in the case of Melton and, and GP2 or are trying really hard on defense in the case of, of Pods. And, you know, Moses is, you know, tries really hard defensively. Uh, even Buddy Hill right now, <laughs> he's trying really hard defensively. So that just goes to show you again, like the Warriors are locked in right now. They've been locked in since the start of preseason. I mean, that Clippers game was not great, but really since then they have been locked in and it's just been a continuation of what we saw in preseason. Going back to the, the preview episode I did yesterday, like the fact the Warriors were mi- just minus two and a half, the line was two and a half. Now I did wake up this morning it, uh, Steph and Draymond were locked in, so the line did jump out to, I think it might have been five, six and a half, whatever it was. Uh, but even that just was crazy to me. Now, the total points I thought was going to be uh, over 232 and a half. That didn't get up, unfortunately, because the Warriors were just too good defensively. They were too good defensively, kept uh, the Jazz to 86 points, kept them to, I think, 31.4% shooting from the floor, 21% from three-point range. The Jazz chucked up 42 threes. They're not going to be a good three-point shooting team. They only took 26 on Wednesday against the Grizzlies. But you have to give the Warriors credit. This is a Jazz team that put up 124 points on on Memphis in the season opener. And so for the Warriors to keep them to those shooting splits, to keep them to uh, 86 points as a team, to keep Lowry Markinen as quiet as they did. And again, it was just the physicality. I think it was the physicality. Like Markinen was having to settle for a lot of tough jump shots, ends up finishing 13 points. I think he was four of 17 from the floor, one of five from three-point range, uncharacteristically missed quite a few free throws as well. And so it's not just the offense with the Warriors pouring in 140 points against the Blazers and another 127 points here, but it's the defense. And of course, the way the Warriors want to play, if they can be elite defensively, then they're probably going to be really good on offense because they want to run in transition. They want to get stops and get out and basically get a shot up as soon as possible from their defensive stop. Like they don't want to be in a half court offense. And so defense, you know, it's the old adage of defense leading to offense. And that's been the case for the Warriors uh, over the first two games. Uh, just a couple of things more. I'm not not negatives, but concerns. So the starting lineup again. I think they were they fell behind 13-6 uh, with that opening five, which I mean the spacing again is is going to be a concern. I the the fact that you've won these games so easily, and the fact that the the starters were so dominant to open the third quarter, where you come out with a 14 point lead and you pretty much double it within five minutes, you have to. I think you just continue with it. Like, I think that's that's no issue, but the jury's still out. The jury's still out on whether it's going to be effective. And if we get to a stage where a couple of these slow starts end up actually hurting the Warriors and, you know, resulting in losses by the end of it, then that's when I think we should start talking more about, you know, do, do we need to change things up? Does Heald or Melton uh, need to come into the starting lineup? One of Kaminga or Jackson Davis go out. Th- those questions could emerge. But while you're winning, I wouldn't change it up. And again, they were dominant in the third quarter. Kaminga, I think specifically, is certainly, from a concern standpoint, the one we have to focus on over these first two games. He has 10 points, four rebounds, four turnovers, a few fouls in the first half of Wednesday's game against the Trailblazers. And then today, two points, one of five shooting, just one rebound, played less than 18 minutes, which again, I mean, that's not necessarily a him issue. That's just the fact that the Warriors have so many players. And again, he didn't have to play in the fourth quarter because, you know, Steve was able to rest all his starters. I just wonder, like, with the Warriors playing this way, 
offensively. Like, I wonder where he gets his looks aside from his one bucket came in transition, uh, where I think it might have been a lob dunk. Can't remember who threw it, but I think his one bucket, one bucket came from uh, a lob dunk in transition. And, like, where else does he get his offense? Like, how do the Warriors, because there's so much movement, there's so much three-point shooting right now. I don't know. It, it looked okay in preseason. Like, his shot was falling in preseason. I'm not going to overreact. It hasn't been good the first two games. But, again, when you win by 77, you can you know, you know can forgive some things. And I think for him individually, we saw what he did in preseason. It was quite impressive. I think he was second on the team in scoring behind Moody. The three ball was falling. And so, you know, maybe there's a there's a regression. Like, they're going to need, like, things won't be this easy <laughs> against better opposition. Things will not be this easy where you can just go out, chuck up a heap of threes. They made another 20 today. Chuck up a heap of threes and win games by 30-plus points. Now, it'd be great if they can continue winning games by that much, but that won't happen. They'll face better opposition. And I think when that happens, they're going to need some of JK's physicality and athleticism on the interior to finish at the basket, to be a guy, a go-to guy offensively where you can throw the ball to him in the post and he can actually make some plays out of that. And he's got the kind of fall-away mid-range jumper, which he's really worked on. He can get to the free-throw line. We know second half of last season he was unstoppable at the rim. So they're going to need him. That They will need him now. They haven't needed him over these first two games. And the fact they go out and still win so comfortably is, is fantastic. But it's going to get tougher, and when that happens, I think they are going to need what Jonathan Kaminga brings them in terms of athleticism and force at the rim because they don't otherwise have that, right? And so I think, you know, in some ways we can question, okay, where does he fit into this? And the first two games haven't been great, but I think there's also a part where it's like, okay, he's not fitting into it right now, but there will come stages where the Warriors will need him and will need the unique skill set that he brings to the team that no one else has. And so I'm not overreacting to JK right now. Not great, but it, it looked okay in preseason, and I think it's worth persisting with this starting lineup for the moment and just rolling with it and seeing what happens until you start losing games or until you start getting some close games and not blowing teams out by a combined 77 points in the first two games, then why make too many drastic... It's the same with the 12-man rotation call. Like, I don't think, and a lot of people I know, because it's been quite a talking point after that season opener against the Blazers, I don't think a 12-man rotation will work over the course of a season. I think there will come times where it's like, no, you've got to put this away, Steve. You can't continue with this. But while you're still winning, then I wouldn't change it now. <laughs> like there's no, there's literally no reason to change it now. Now I think those reasons will come and there'll, there'll come a point where they, they do need to make some change. And Steve does need to make some hard calls with the rotation. But until that point, keep doing what you're doing. Like don't change a winning formula. Yes. Tinker with some things here and there, maybe try and get Kaminga involved a little bit more. I don't know, but like you're not going to make any drastic changes to the rotation right now with the performances that you put up over the, the first two games. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's too much else. I'm just having a look through here. Uh, I want to give a shout-out to Loon. Loon and GB too. I want to give a shout-out to those guys. So Loon has nine points, 10 rebounds. Warriors just smashed the Jazz on the glass. What, 66 rebounds, I think, to – hang on, I've misread that. Um, just having a uh, – 60, 60 rebounds for the Jazz – and, yeah, 66 for the Warriors. So, actually, they didn't smash them as much as what I thought, but it really felt like they did bruise them on the boards. Uh, as I said, nine points, ten boards for Loon. Seven offensive. Like, unbelievable. He's, when he, Whenever he gets to the free throw line for these mid-range jumpers, which he had another one today, it's just, like, automatic at the moment. He hasn't extended out to the three-point line at all, but those mid-range jumpers are actually looking quite nice. And the one, two he takes each game, they seem to be going in, so that's good. It's almost like a – again, it's it's being used as Steve wanted as like a bailout option. There was a play today where GP2 was kind of in the post area, didn't have nowhere to go, time running down a little bit. Loon just like kind of cuts to the free throw line and then gets the ball, puts up a midi, makes it. Cool, fine. Uh, I mean, he's been excellent. 
He's been really good. He's revitalized a little bit, looking really energetic, kind of playing in a way that you can see he's lost some weight and, and playing uh, to p- playing in a way that really shows that, like playing with a little bit more energy and, and athleticism, which we'd seen decline from Loon last season. So, I mean, he's been really, really good. And GP2 as well. I thought GP2 was going to get lost in the mix here in terms of the rotation, and he's come out and just doing – what he does kind of thing. So shout out to those guys because, you know, I'd seen them as two players that probably should have, you know, been out of the rotation, but they're certainly putting their hand up to remain in the rotation. If there is a point in which, you know, Steve needs to go to less than 12, but at this point there's no reason to take anyone out of the rotation at all. I mean, Kyle Anderson played well. Melton's defense is unbelievable. Buddy, we know what he's doing, as I said at the start. So uh, even Lindy Waters the third again, just coming in, nailing two of three from beyond the arc for another six points. I mean, it's got, it's just funny, really. That guy should be playing more, uh, and for another team. I, I don't know if I was another team, I'd try to be, I'd try to target him in some way in a trade because he could, he could literally be like he's. You look at a guy like Sam Hauser on the Celtics, who's essentially their eighth man, like behind their top six, and if you want to say Pritchard. And, and Hauser are like seventh, eighth. Like Lindy Waters could be a Sam Hauser version for a team and be a top eight rotation player. And yet on the Warriors, he's 13th in the rotation and not playing at all until these blowout minutes where he's now, what, four or five from beyond the arc over the first two games. Uh, I'll finish it up there. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252. That's POK252 on X slash Twitter. Also on Instagram, TikTok now at Golden State with mates. So check us out there. I might be back tomorrow for a preview episode uh, for the game against the Clippers, which is an early start, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday. Looking forward to that one. Uh, Should be more of a challenge for the Warriors, but I'll get into that a little bit more tomorrow, likely on a podcast episode. Otherwise, you can always check out my work at bluemanhoop.com as well. Other than that, guys, thank you for listening. Enjoy your weekend.